Welcome everyone. My name is Linda Harwood Swenson and uh, I am one of the four artists showing in the Shift Gallery in April for 2021. I'll be leading a conversation with the four other artists that are, I'm sorry, the three other artists that are showing this month, Amanda Sweet, Cynthia Hibbard, and Susan Turek. Uh, because we are still in a global pandemic, this conversation will be virtual. Um, so let me start with Amanda. I'm going to pin her here and unpin me. There. Okay, welcome Amanda. Um, so Amanda's show is uh, titled Uncharted and it's a group of 10 paintings created through a a spray and masking technique depicting natural undulating forms. As they hang together, um, as you might see behind me and maybe you saw during the introduction, um, uh, the wall feels like almost like an ocean wave retreating to me. It's very, there's a ton of movement, there's a lot of um, uh, organic shapes and uh, brush marks, and it's really exciting. Um, so in your statement about the show, you mentioned your use of Zen painting methods. Can you explain what you mean by Zen painting methods? Sure, and thanks for the intro, Linda. Um, so for this body of work, I adopted um, a number of Zen painting concepts. Um, it's been quite therapeutic. Uh, the whole goal for this body of work really for me was to find balance. Um, and that's balance, you know, emotional stability, my, my own um, finding a sense of inner calm, but also the, the balance within the paintings, the, the two-dimensional design properties. And um, all of the paintings in the show, they, they have at least two layers of paint. There's the underpainting and then there's the, the paint on top. And after I, I apply the underpainting, um, I put down a series of uh, masking fluid in the form of brush strokes. Um, and I'm standing above the works. Um, so there's gravity at play, the works are on the floor. Um, and in this period, uh, in period of the process of making a work, um, I aim to relax, to focus, and essentially reset. Um, like Zen painting, I'm trying to be, you know, present in the present moment, um, clearing my mind of all the outside chatter that is, you know, the, the changing and shifting times of our daily lives. Um, and I'm really just trying to um, clear my mind and focus on the work. And um, th those marks are very quick and gestural like Zen painting. Um, unlike Zen painting though, there are some paintings that have several layers of those brush strokes. So it's not just nailing one and sticking to it, but some of them become a search and a journey of their own. Um, and um, I, I still very much feel like the director here. So in a way, I'm kind of choreographing this dance of um, marks and color and texture. The, the mark making is carrying the color and texture um, to create and define that space. You know, unlike Zen painting, I'm, I'm very conscious of my underpainting because I am um, thinking of the ways in which those brush strokes can either uh, become a window into the underpainting, um, creating sort of a, a, you know, a deep space, um, or alternatively become a, a pop of color. Um, they've maybe captured a vibrant color that then advances to the foreground, um, as opposed to that receding deep space. Yeah, you know, each piece is so unique, but you can see that they're all connected through their method. You know, there, there are so many different tones and moods in each piece, so it's really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your earlier work. Um, I, because I had the opportunity to research you a little bit. Um, I loved how your earlier work, there was this really specific focus on land and um, especially your work that's right behind you, <laughs> conveniently called the history of land. Um, you're actually using red clay and some of your other work is using wax and building up layers and thinking about this sort of like real, um, I don't know, just this textural kind of heaviness. And um, so now this work is clearly focused on water. Can you talk a little bit about how that shift in subject matter came about? 
Sure. Um, the work behind me is very um, personal. And like you said, it involves the red, uh, actual red clay. Um, it was excavated from the source, which was um, my family land in South Carolina. Um, and just to touch on that for a second, the, um, my upbringing in South Carolina, uh, it was in a rural setting on countryside and um, my mom and dad instilled in me a very early affinity um, toward nature, appreciation for it. And um, I've always, in terms of my art making, uh, turned to nature as my muse, um, whether it's landscape or seascape. And um, it wasn't really until my, uh, my travels out here to Seattle, which was for grad school initially, um, that I started to think about what I really wanted to do with the landscape. Um, and so instead of depicting the imagery, it was more about capturing the essence of it. And um, for this work behind me, um, I actually like hand mold the, the red clay into oil paint to paint with it. And I was really thinking more about the emotional weight that a material can carry. And so for me, um, tying back to my ancestral roots, um, thinking about my family's past struggles, like in the late 18th century, early 19th century in South Carolina, living off the land and um, they were livestock and um, uh, farmers and uh, crop farmers. <clears throat> but this area that I pulled the red clay from, I actually brought a picture um, in case we were to touch on it. Um, this is a portion of that land and that's me in the bottom over here, probably when I was age 10 or so. Um, but you can see that the top soil is all gone. It was eroded away by water runoff. Um, so <clears throat> that to me was just this really powerful image of like exposed raw material and I wanted to do something with it. Um, but, you know, after making this painting and spending more time in, in Seattle and, and the surrounding area, um, I started to explore more and more of Puget Sound and it had just a great influence on my work. Um, and specifically with this body of work, looking at the inter intertidal zone of Puget Sound and looking at the, the tide pools there and all of the life that inhabits them and thinking about, you know, not, not just land or water, but how water shapes land and the shoreline and its effect on it. Um, you know, going back to that, you know, nature, doesn't have that, um, a perfect balance, and that it's quite dynamic, but it's actually that, that duality that, that poses a, a very inspirational challenge to my work to capture that actually, uh, you know, the, the dynamic of it all in motion and flux and, um, yeah. I feel like there's this um, sense of longing, you know, or so, some sort of, I mean, I hate, I don't know if that's the right word, but this idea of connection, belonging geographically to either, you know, the earlier work where you were and currently the sound. And then I also just was so interested in how your experience was at um, RISD, coming from South Carolina to RISD to New York to Seattle. I mean, that feels like uh, big moves, you know? Was that, what was that like for you? Yeah, definitely. I grew up spending a lot of time exploring nature. I mean, a lot of our uh, land in South Carolina is forested. So I, I went on many walks, you know, with my parents out there and really grew an appreciation for nature and for, for our land. But um, eventually I realized that I was quite sheltered and I needed, you know, more culture and, and um, to, to get out there and see more people. And felt like I was lacking that in my really small um, hometown in South Carolina. And so uh, going off to RISD to just be in a boat of, you know, international, um, you know, young artist, and it was a real big eye opener. And in, uh, as was New York, especially. Um, but it didn't take very long while I was there that I started to miss my subject matter and um, to miss miss the mountains, miss the forest, miss the water and New York City, I didn't have that. And so it didn't take me long before I moved, I actually moved down to, to North Carolina to see a new area there, the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, and then out to here. And, and I applied to grad schools out here. And so that was certainly the draw, but it was specifically this environment where you have, you know, a city that is um, butting against 
uh, the sea and, you know, the sound and, um, and the mountains not far away. And so uh, to, to be in this area, I mean, that was, that was a huge draw for, for my continued art education. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna uh, unpin you and I'm gonna pin um, my iPhone and I'm going to um, take a little tour of the wall here and we'll see how that goes. All right, our next artists are Cynthia Hibbert and Susan Turek, who worked together in creating the show Facing Inward and Out, uh, described as the collaboration of narrative portraiture in ironic and offbeat paper forms, which is such a great description. Um, it should be noted that Cynthia is a longtime member of Shift Gallery and has invited Susan um, to show with her, I think, three times. So I wanted to start by asking them about this collaboration and if this happened sort of, um, uh, like did the idea come first or did the collaboration come first? At first I'm going to unpin myself and pin you guys. So hang on one sec. Okay, so um, just to reiterate, we were just asking a little bit up about the collaboration for this project and how did it come about? Susan had been working okay. on a series of um, seniors from her high school class um, when we talked about putting the show together. So I tried to sort of dovetail into that idea. And I had at the same time been making little um, <clears throat> imaginary mosaics while I was sitting watching TV during the pandemic. And we have a mutual growing up in Los Angeles together and a long history together. So we just sort of talked and evolved from there and worked on different series that had relation, either direct relationship to our upbringing, specifically Susan. And in my case, sort of uh, um, a more indirect relationship to my upbringing, sort of as a, more of a springboard. Susan, is there anything you want to add to that? I, I think Cynthia has uh, done a, a, a very good job of describing how we have come together to create this collaboration. Um, um, I would say what's interesting is the two series that, that really do interact with each other and um, are in some ways opposition to each other are, are high school experiences. Um, I went to a large public high school in um, the San Fernando Valley, and she went to a very elite <laughs> girls high school on the other side of the hill. And, um, but we both did portraits of our class. And so that is, I think, especially how things do dovetail together. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna pin, um, Cynthia and ask her a couple of questions now specifically about her work. Okay, great. Um, so Cynthia, I, um, I love the humor in this show and the lens that you have on the past, especially um, how it's like slightly distorted with your media choice. Um, can you talk a little bit about this show this uh, right behind me called um, Queen for a Day and how that came about? And especially, I'm sort of interested in, in your process, you know, the background, the foreground, and also the idea. Well, the background um, is definitely from my past because those are all um, printing scraps that I have collaged. I save everything from, um, you know, my throwaway pile in the studio and it ends up recycled. Um, 
And the concept of that is from my past, as I explained in the legend, in that um, the idea came from a famous TV show in the 60s. Uh, the MC of that show, Queen for a Day, lived across the street from me. And I would see him leave for the studio every day in his Cadillac. <laughs> And then later on, it was in his Mercedes, because one of the things about growing up in LA in the 60s, it was not only a Tinseltown culture, but it was also a car culture. Cars were very important. And during that era, you know, the Cadillac with the fins were the status, but then it quickly moved to the Mercedes as this is being a step up. And so I would think about this guy all the time and wonder about this show. And I had no hope of ever being on it so um, because I was a school child, but I reimagined the idea and thought about um, how to honor uh, women um, uh, who had no other fame about them, no claim to fame other than their existence. And so these are four of the longest lived women in recent history. And the fourth one is still alive She's 118, she lives in Japan, and she's slated to carry the Olympic torch in the uh, Tokyo Games this summer if she survives. And the other three all live to be 117, and they come from Japan, Italy, and Jamaica. And I just sort of love their stories. And of course, they're all stars on the internet. Um, oh, I didn't know that. That's well, well, that's how I found them, yes. Yeah, and this is a woodcut, is that right? Yeah, this last year I've been doing a lot of uh, woodcuts um, and uh, portraiture in this case. A woodcut is a fun way to do portraiture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I also love some of the more whimsical, and I mean, this is whimsical as well, but the, the, fun, the, uh, the fun work that is, I think it's called, um, the Do Right Women and Violets and Babies. And I love how you're honoring women in those pieces. And um, it's also really captures this idea of what people are up to in uh, during the pandemic and those long nights and how you got through them. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about your experience this past year and how those pieces came to be. Well, you know, my life hasn't changed as much as most people's um, because I live alone and I don't have a family. So I just sort of go about my <clears throat> normal routine, but maybe in a more concentrated way. Um, not being able to go out, I subscribe to a lot of magazines and I would just cut them up and sit and paste while watching TV, making up characters. Um, because I have to do something while watching TV. TV is not captivating enough. <laughs> I, I, I need, you know, uh, another activity going at all times. So that was sort of my TV thing. At the uh -huh. moment, I'm doing needlepoint sort of badly. But, oh, um, interesting. The baby sort of reminded me of the show you did a few years ago that was um, uh, sort of based on images from uh, Joshua Tree. It was like the Jesus and Joshua show. And I see a real connection between um, those images. <laughs> well, you know, way back when in our previous life, when we traveled, I went to Europe a lot and saw a lot of Renaissance babies um, and uh, all over, particularly Italy, where um, the Christ child is king uh, for centuries. And you can travel through Europe you know, just looking at images of Mary and Jesus. And um, I was always interested as Jesus, as the baby boy <clears throat> dying on the cross, this is somehow more appealing. And actually some of the early Jesuses are quite funny looking characters. So I took a lot of photographs, um, particularly in Italy and Siena uh, and in Florence and, um, the Jesus portrait, which always sort of cracked me up, just sort of stuck with me as an image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The Joshua tree, because of course, they both begin with J. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, okay, so now I want to switch things up and talk to Susan a little bit. So I'm going to move my computer and I'm just going to uh, unpin. All right. 
Susan, um, I'm really fascinated with the Chuck and Dora story. Um, how did you decide to create this work? Um, I love how it honors their sense of adventure and freedom while at the same time it has this nod to the ironic. Well, Chuck and Doris, um, Doris was my mother and Chuck was her boyfriend. And in her later years, um, she became involved with Chuck. And for her, I think it was wonderful because she could finally, finally embark. Uh, she had a daughter, me, who was grown up and she could, and she was retired from her job and so go off and do all the things I think she wanted to do. So Chuck, as I said, was her boyfriend and they had decided to take a trip back to my mother's birthplace, which was Duluth, Minnesota. And I think my mother had a very uh, sweet life and wonderful life in Duluth. So she always, a part of her always lived back in Duluth, Minnesota. And this was the ideal spot. Uh, so they, they, when I came across these snapshots of them, they were taken with a, a Instamatic camera and the thing with the Instamatic camera, of course, is that you don't get the, the wonderful definition of people and backgrounds and everything. They really are just snapshots. And when I looked at them, I realized that really there was nothing in the background that could, could indicate where they were. I mean, there weren't any sort of signposts, some famous monument. Yeah, it's just so like they really the could moment. be anywhere. Yeah, yeah. totally. It's just like they're so present in that. Exactly. Moment. And yeah, right. And what was important, I think, is that they were photographs only of themselves. I mean, that was the main focus. Like here's Chuck, and here's Doris, and and that's what they were doing. So when I created them. Uh, or reproduce them, I should say, more colorful and more, more in color and in more detail. And the background was really sort of this soft um, sort of focus. And again, they could be anywhere. And the only indication that they were somewhere or an actual signpost was this map, which no one may recognize, of Minnesota on this post. And, um, and that was their end, that was their destination. So that was what I saw in all the yeah. photos. And they look like they're having a really good time. You know, you could just feel it from their- Oh, I think they how, did. How they I think, I think they did. It was a real, like, it was a real freedom for my mother, I think, and very exciting that she finally got to go somewhere. <laughs> and those are wash on vellum, is that right? They're gouache and acrylic on vellum, and the figures, Chuck and Doris, were actually um, cut out Xeroxes of them that I um, painted and cut over. Um, so the, the Xerox is cut off onto the vellum, is that right? I'm sorry, you were breaking yes. a little yes, bit. Yes, that's right. Okay, yes. that's interesting. Yes, um, right, and the figures, as I said, were in great detail because that was the focal point of their snapshots. It was really all about them. Yeah, it's really fun. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your multi-piece uh, right behind me of Taft High School class of 1964, oh, seniors one through 20? Right. What was the impetus right. to create um, this? Well, again, I was going through various books and I came across my senior yearbook and I was thumbing through looking for people that I knew um, somehow I assumed that I had, I knew everyone in my senior class, but I realized that really I only knew a handful of people because my class was 800 people. I mean, it was a huge school in the San Fernando Valley, again, part of the Los Angeles City School District, and uh, those schools were very, very large. The district was huge. And so <clears throat> as I poured over these photos, I started thinking about all of these various people, ones I just never even knew who they were. And I started imagining uh, what, what they actually were in high school and maybe their sort of dreams for the future. I mean, I think senior portraits are these sort of um, archetypal photos 
I think that they're just, they're a bit of mythology. And first of all, they were all black and white, no color at that point. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to make their faces in black and white, which were more accurate to the actual photo. Mm. And then their clothes, I could, I could really make them, it, you know, there would be a whole different wardrobe. I could add color, um, their hair, I could add color. And some were more accurate to what they were wearing, except I didn't know what color the outfit was. And then I, I started cutting out pieces of magazine type and trying to decide, again, maybe what club they were in in high school. We had millions of clubs in this huge school and what, they're, what they might be thinking at the time. And, and I just... I just took my scissors and glue stick and magazine, and I really had fun with this. And it was funny because someone said, oh, are you going to do your whole class? And I thought, no, I'm not doing 800 students. <laughs> so I decided to stop at, I think it's 20. So. And then I think you might have touched on this, but talk a little bit about how you gave them hobbies and things like that. But is that what you meant when you said that dreams for the future? Well, I, again, uh, um, I, a lot of them, I, um, I made members of clubs that were part of the high school, what I thought they should be members of. Some of it was really accurate. There were a couple of, you know, the high school hunk that played football and uh, was the sweetheart, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, love them and leave them kind of guy. And, and, uh, and, you know, there is, I think, a prom queen that was accurate. And again, there was, I think at the bottom, there are two twins um the the green twins i can't remember oh, the names. Yeah. i had actually yeah. thought about putting names on them then i was a little then i was a little worried <laughs> so and then some i did know they were sort of the science nerds that were in my class that actually were extremely interesting um kids but weren't in quite the social uh circle that a lot of people ran in so yeah now they're really that was how i came to um <laughs> to um, Deciding, deciding what they should be and what they wanted to be. And maybe they became, I don't know. Well, I know a couple that what they became, but. Cool. I love how- I think that's how it dovetails into Cynthia's. That's what so I was gonna say. Yeah, I think that's yeah. how it dovetails into you guys talk Cynthia's. a little bit of, about that, about the, like, sort of the, the um, conversation that this bigger piece is having, Violet's piece, that, you know, Cynthia's, experience and your experience kind of having this conversation across the room. Very, very different high schools, I think. Um, so Cynthia could speak to her high school. <laughs> My graduating class was 74, or no, 73. Um, uh, so I, I, I represented the class with six out of 73, which I think is a larger proportion than than Susan represented actually, <laughs> and it was a different world. There were no boys, you know. We wore uniforms. It was all very strict and uh, restricted. Um, uh, it was back in time. And it's funny back. how you both did a teacher. You did your English teacher, right? And she did the principal, right? It's really interesting. I did the uh, principal. Who was her she was the classic principal. I mean, just her looks. And she would get on the PA system every morning and say, good morning, Toreadors. That was our mascot. And we would all laugh because we would wait every morning for this, this uh, welcome PA from her. And uh, I don't think I really had any contact with her at all, except for that. <laughs> So well, uh, I Cynthia had, can uh, speak to I, her English teacher. I had plenty of contact with Miss Karn. She was a force of nature. She was a member <laughs> of the um, uh, committee that put together Webster's uh, Dictionary. Um, and she was a very strict teacher that we lived in fear of. She thought so little of our poultry efforts that um, she would grade us with the entire alphabet. So you could get a Q on your essay, which you understood so far beyond failing that you know it almost reached the end of the alphabet. Um, she was quite a character and uh, famous at Marlboro. 
um, she was, uh, yeah. We dedicated our, our senior annual to her, I think because we were just so intimidated by her, we could think of no one else to honor. <laughs> So Linda, I wanted to talk a little bit about your show, Color, Light, and Space. Just like with Amanda's work, um, the environment, nature has always been a touchstone for you, but unlike Amanda's more Zen-like focus, for, for you, it seems more like a springboard into abstraction. Um, and this, do you wanna talk a little bit about that idea in this body of work? Sure. Um... That's a, that's a great way of putting it, that it is. I was thinking about how uh, my landscape work and my um, abstract work are really almost the same, except for there's this introduction of negative space in my landscape work, not just in this body of work, but in all you know my past work. And so I think that when I introduced that, um, that little bit of negative space, then I start to get this a little bit of a narrative, you know, throughout the, the composition. And so I think it's, um, I think it's just sort of like a toggle right now. Sometimes I'm, you know, with like with this piece right behind me, this is enough for me to be atmospheric and mood oriented. But then in these pieces over here, I'm telling a little bit of a story using the negative space to sort of create um, uh, some, let's say like just some tension around the pieces so that there's an idea of what could happen next. So in your past work, you had a show one time called The Land of Nowhere. And I actually have a monotype from that series. Um, oh, you did? Yeah. You were, uh, so yeah, and I think you did the last, you know, when people have tried to pin you on interpretations of your work, that you want to keep it a little bit open for the audience to come in and, you know, take the significance for themselves. But in this series, which you uh, addressed from a residency, um, in California during fire season, there's a real direct relationship with your environment there. It was, I think, more specific in a way than other bodies of your work. And those beautiful um, prints in the background almost look like um, fire maps mm -hmm. in a way. Fire maps, oh, oh that's, that's interesting. You know, the image for this became really, really real for me. I um... I would take walks in Petaluma every day. And I was, when, whenever I've gone to residencies, I always have sort of like this horrible anxiety because I put so much pressure on myself to produce work. And I was starting to exercise a lot to get rid of some of the anxiety and trying to just, you know, uh, calm down, I guess. And, uh, but I would really start to see shapes like this and colors like this, you know, just, 
in the landscape and I was really struck with how I just wanted to sort of start working with simple shapes, simple colors and simple forms in this very rudimentary, you know, sort of like relief style. And, and so this was really a specific experience for me versus the other landscape pieces that came before it, which were more, um, more generalized, you know, more about beauty or mood or um, not necessarily like specific place, but this, this was a place for me. This was like a real experience where I would walk and I would see these simplified forms and then the colors would sort of, um, I mean, obviously there weren't like bright red bushes or anything, but there, there was this essence of, um, of, the colors in nature were just very different. Number one, I was coming from Seattle and I was in North Cal California. So it was like a different landscape. So I was seeing it differently than maybe somebody who lives there, but also the, um, the air was super thick with smoke. And so things started to look super ethereal. And you can see that in your large painting there, which is, um, which is sort of a blow up uh, a different dimension from your very specific prints. Um, yeah, well, this actually, um, I, I'm, I teach at Seattle Art Museum and I've been teaching the color field painters all fall. And so I was redoing my studio and doing all these pours. These are all, you know, paint that's poured onto raw canvas. And I was like, I love this. And <laughs> which happens to me all the time at, when I'm investigating things I have to teach. Um, but I, this time I was like, no, and I had these huge um, uh, wood um, braces from a friend that moved out of town a few years ago. And I've just been, I have these six huge braces that I've been moving around for years now. And I was like, I have the braces. <clears throat> I know what I'm going to do. And so I've just, so I, you know, it is true. The colors are connected, but I feel like there, this is a different for me, this is a different project, you know, but then, you know, of course, everything sort of connects. Well, whether unconsciously or not, it seems to thematically tie in because, you know, it looks like a raging fire uh, in the same color scheme as your more specific mm -hmm. shapes. <laughs> yeah, my previous shows have all been like blues and greens, you know, and then this, I did the, the geranium pink does, uh, surface, you know, in a lot of my work too, but, but yeah, I'm surprised that I am moving to the warm colors somehow right now. Yeah. So we have less than a minute left. Um, I guess the only thing I can add is that also another series called, um, uh, it's called, uh, everything's falling apart and, or something's falling apart. No, I can't remember what I named it. And so that is a series of five um, letterpress relief works that were super tricky to make. And um, I, I feel like they, um, they also are very connected to the time period that I was making uh, this work. And I moved to uh, same colors, same colors, same shapes, same, actually the same, physically the same um, pieces of plastic relief that I used on the, on the plate were the same.